Hi everyone, welcome to My Weight Live. We have a very special episode for you tonight with the Scientific Director of Obesity Canada, Dr. Sanjeev Sakalingam, about the connection between mental health and obesity or excess weight. Before we get started, tell me in the comments where you're watching from and let us know if it's your first time joining us. Dr. Sakalingam, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. You're a psychiatrist who's really done a lot of research on issues related to obesity and mental health. So let's start there. Tell us about the link between the two conditions. Well, obesity is really uh, a disease of many conditions, and mental health is one of those many conditions. And as a psychiatrist, I, I really feel privileged that I actually have insights into some of the intersect for many of the patients that I see. We know that for people living with obesity, there are high rates of mental illness. And when I say mental illness, that is mental health and addictions issues as well. And so, for example, if we look at people who have obesity, about 20 to 30% have a lifetime history of depression, a little more with a mood disorder. There are many patients who are living with obesity who also have eating disorders, and the main one being binge eating disorder as well, which we would commonly hear about. And, and we can talk a lot more about that as well, because we know that binge eating is used quite uh, ubiquitously throughout uh, the media, but there are specific clinical conditions related to binge eating itself. And then I would also say that uh, in addition to uh, mood and eating problems, anxiety is another issue that is quite common amongst people who are living with obesity. But what's really interesting is that people who have mental health conditions early on, they often are at higher risk of developing obesity. So a really important example would be people with severe mental illness like schizophrenia or psychotic illnesses we know that they have up to a threefold increased risk of developing obesity, and about half of them end up developing obesity over the course of their lifetime, which is quite huge. And partly that's related to some of the medications that I, I unfortunately, and many of my other colleagues prescribe to treat mental health conditions, but it's also related to genetics and other factors that we don't fully understand that are occurring in people who don't even take medications for their mental illness. So it's really fascinating in an area of research, but important for us to recognize as clinicians. So my next question for you is going to be, does obesity put us at risk, higher risk for having other mental health conditions? But it also sounds like other mental health conditions put us at higher risk for obesity. Am I understanding that right? You're understanding it perfectly. It is a chicken egg phenomenon, like what came first here? And it's really hard to tease out. I think for many of the studies, and we have lots of information from looking at large population databases uh, to see these associations that show that people living with obesity do have higher rates of mental illness, including addictions, but that people with mental illness and addictions also have higher rates of obesity. And there are many factors that contribute to that relationship. Tell us what some of these contributing factors are. Well, there are many factors that are overlap between obesity and mental illness. And partly when we think about them, we can think of biological, uh, psychological, and, and social or environmental factors. So biological factors, I don't know many people are aware of this, but we actually know that in many mental health conditions, there are increased inflammation states in people with uh, mental illness. So in mood disorders, for example, bipolar disorder, depression, we actually do see higher inflammatory markers, um, so higher rates of inflammation. Now that hasn't translated into treatment, but it does actually factor into our understanding. And of course, we know in obesity, it is a pro-inflammatory or high inflammatory state. So some of the hypothesis is that there might be some relationship there as well. The other factor is that we know that our brain and our, our hormones are so intricately connected. And in terms of that connection, we know that hormones can play a role in how people uh, experience mood issues, anxiety, other conditions. Um, and so if we look at uh, obesity, of course, we know that hormonal factors are a huge factor overall. And so you can see that there might be an interplay or some abnormality in hormonal imbalances that might infect the brain and have this circular pattern. The other factors are psychosocial. So if we think about people who are living with mental illness, if you're feeling depressed, you're probably not going to be following your regimen. It's hard to be motivated, not because you're, it's your uh, person who's not able to, 
in the sense that you're not wanting to, but more so that your brain might not be working as well and you have a medical condition, depression's a medical condition, that might be limiting you from doing so. And so then if you have someone who's also living with obesity or at risk of developing obesity and they're not able to pay attention to their nutrition, they may end up developing a weight gain and start to develop excess fat tissue, which will lead to obesity. We're going to pause here and do our trivia question. If you answer tonight's question, you will get our super helpful guide to getting coverage for the medical treatments you need. All you have to do is answer our trivia question, which is, true or false, obesity is a chronic medical condition. Is that true or false? Put your best guess in the comments and you will get that guide delivered to your Facebook Messenger inbox. And folks, if you can think of any friends or family members who might find this show helpful, please tag them in the comments so they can tune in too. So we know that some psychiatric medications have weight gain as a possible side effect. What should people know about that? I'm embarrassed to say this, but many of the medications I prescribe to help people who are living with mental illness and to treat their conditions do have a risk of weight gain associated with it. And probably the most notorious of these are antipsychotic medications, which is a bit of a misnomer because they're used for not just psychosis, but for mood disorder, sometimes for depression that's difficult to treat and in other mental health conditions. And there has been a move probably in the late 1990s or so, early 2000s, where we saw a wave of new medications that didn't have a lot of the neurological side effects, but unfortunately had higher rates of uh, weight gain and metabolic so diabetes and other conditions as well. Fortunately, we have more antidepressants that are a bit more weight neutral or a bit safer, but they still can have weight effects long term. I think an important factor for us to recognize is that if people develop obesity while we're treating their primary psychiatric or mental health condition, we know the outcomes for that mental health condition are actually worse. So a great example are people with mood disorders, particularly bipolar disorder, we have great data that shows that if people are treated with a medication and they are gaining weight or are struggling with obesity, that they probably will have less response for their bipolar disorder and are more likely to have relapses. So it really speaks to how closely knit the uh, obesity and the mood disorder is in the treatment of patients uh, long term. So you mentioned antidepressants, and I know a lot of people are on antidepressants. If they're noticing that they're gaining weight since their doctor has prescribed that particular antidepressant, is that something they want to go back to the doctor and talk about? Like, should they explore other options? I think for patients, it's really hard to think about what should they bring to their doctor and what should they talk about. But I would say we know that because of obesity's impact on health, but also the mental health condition that they're getting help for, it's important for patients to know it's okay to raise this issue. There are a range of medications that we have for mental health conditions, and they're really good for treating these conditions. And because of that choice, we could probably have that conversation as a, as a psychiatrist. I would welcome that conversation to explore what those options are because I would hate for someone to kind of suffer in silence and be worried about weight gain and some of the other metabolic side effects, knowing that we could have had this conversation earlier and maybe changed the trajectory. So be honest with our doctor, bring it up if it's exactly. something we're concerned about. Exactly. So how does weight stigma in and of itself impact mental health? Weight stigma is something that remains prevalent. And I, I hate to say it because we're doing a lot of work to advocate and increase awareness and we have a better understanding of obesity. But weight stigma really impacts the individual and many people living with obesity can speak to that. It's probably the most prominent thing I hear about from my patients. And weight stigma refers to that notion of the beliefs, the acts, behaviors, the acts of discrimination that occur because of someone's size in the context of obesity. We know that people who experience weight stigma have higher rates of depression, anxiety, lower self-esteem. You could also see it's a vicious cycle, right? Someone who's experiencing weight stigma, whether it's at work, at their doctor's office, at home, school, will start to become more withdrawn, more self-doubt. It impacts their identity. And as all those things can start to lead to the psychological distress that someone might have. And of course, if people experience distress like that for a long period of time, they're going to develop 
depression, anxiety, like social anxiety, for example, is a very common thing for people with weight stigma. So all of those factors kind of come together to increase the rates of mental health conditions. It sounds like also that we begin to internalize that weight stigma we experience in the outside world and that internalized bias some becomes a negative inner voice that we're hearing as well. How might someone figure out if that's something they're experiencing and what can they do about it? Internalized weight bias really is when that individual starts to uh, think and believe what they're hearing, saying, or experiencing from the external world. It is quite profound because you can imagine that starts impacting identity. It becomes a place where people might feel stuck, they might feel alone. It is one of the things that really can lead to people disengaging from supports and treatment. And it also is associated with further increase in mental health complications like depression and anxiety and other factors, and even loneliness. And we know loneliness is a huge thing after the pandemic, but also has significant impacts uh, in terms of health overall. So a lot of what you're describing is this vicious cycle that where obesity can lead to mental health issues and then mental health issues can lead to obesity. How might someone begin to break that cycle? Like where, where can we start? Well, the first factor that I would say is that we probably haven't talked a lot about obesity and mental health. So awareness is a huge factor here. I would say the second factor is uh, being able to have people available in integrated teams where we are paying attention to this and able to intervene with. And it's and I've talked a bit about medications and treatment, but I also would say the non-pharmacological treatments like psychotherapy and other psychological treatments. So what are the psychological treatments for obesity that are available now? We have many psychological treatments that have been studied for obesity. And I would probably start by saying that many of the things that we traditionally think about in obesity care are rooted in psychological or behavior change management. And so there are behavioral weight loss interventions. And that first wave of uh, treatments is really about goal setting, monitoring foods, uh, problem solving to get, uh, together, uh, to also uh, think about um, overall changing our motivation and keeping people engaged in treatment. So that's kind of behavioral treatment. And I would say the 101 of psychological treatments for obesity. We now know that there are other treatments available and the evidence starts to increase over time as we think about some of these other interventions. But the next one would be cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. And CBT is a well-studied intervention in many mental health conditions also eating disorders, including binge eating. But CBT for obesity focuses on integrating what I just spoke about in terms of behavioral interventions. So all those things like goal setting and monitoring, but adds on the piece about untangling the automatic or unconscious relationship between our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And so a really tangible example would be a patient who is a, a struggling with obesity, trying to get care through their family doctor. Um, they've tried multiple things. And a common thought is nothing is ever going to work, or I failed at this, or I'm not good enough to even lose this weight. And so those are the automatic thoughts or the thought traps that can happen. And sometimes we don't even pay attention to it. And so CBT tries to really surface that and understand, well, that also that thought triggered that feeling of being down on ourselves or feeling ashamed. Uh, or feeling anxious, um, and it relates, relates to a behavior change as well. And so change in our behaviors where we might, in, an, in response to those feelings, maybe choose things to eat that might be comforting to try to alleviate those emotions or decide not to go to the gym because what's the point, right, at that point, right? And so all the things that we're trying to promote as part of healthier lifestyle might be impacted by this triad of feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. So CBT works by untangling that as a very practical approach. I'll say we have some new wave treatments that are out there, which is very exciting. Right? People don't often think about psychological treatments as new wave, but there are. Um, so mindfulness, so people have talked about mindfulness, and there are interventions like mindful-based uh, eating awareness treatments, which treat kind of disordered eating or maladaptive eating. And so those are really about bringing uh, to the forefront 
the awareness of our relationship with food and, and trying to be okay with that. And then the last would be uh, a new treatment called acceptance commitment therapy, which is really not uh, fighting against our thoughts and feelings that come up when we're dealing with, in this case, obesity management, but accepting it and thinking about ways in which we can tie uh, to our values and our value-based goals. And so that's a, a new wave treatment as well. And so all of these have a little less evidence than, say, behavioral interventions or CBT are, are gaining some ground. So we know that obesity is associated with higher risk of eating disorders, particularly binge eating disorder. Tell us what binge eating disorder is and how someone might know if that's something they're struggling with versus just kind of more classic overeating. This is a, a complex uh, topic only because we know that in the general public, people use the term binge eating all the time. Like I had a binge last night or I binged on this. And I think it's important for us to know there's a clinical condition called binge eating disorder. And then there's binge eating. That can happen once or maybe a couple times, but it doesn't cause any impact on our day-to-day -day or our health. So binge eating disorder, the hallmark of that is really loss of control over eating. So people often describe that they meant to eat a certain amount, they lost control and ate a larger amount than they anticipated or what the average person would be eating in that context. It's also associated with feelings of shame and regret and feeling depressed after that causes that psychological distress. And the last part, it has to impact their functioning. And this has to happen at a frequency and a duration that is you know, several months, not happening for one week and then it's gone, but it's a duration of kind of three months or six months in duration. So we see this longitudinally. So what have we learned about why treating mental health is important in obesity care? What we've learned is that mental health conditions are common in obesity care. We've also learned that if we don't treat mental health conditions, whether it be depression, anxiety, or uh, disordered eating, or even addictions, we will end up actually inadvertently having difficulties in actually treating the condition that people came in to get help with, which is obesity, right? So if we don't recognize and treat it, our treatment outcomes could be at jeopardy. So we have great treatments for obesity, we have great treatments for mental health, but if we don't recognize the mental health conditions and intervene, we're probably not gonna get the outcomes that we are hoping for with our patients long-term. The other, the other factor that we've learned as well is that both of these are chronic complex conditions, and that means that we probably need to reassess both longitudinally. So if someone watching at home is, has been struggling to reach a healthier weight for a long time, what I hear you saying is it's really important to have any depression or anxiety or mental health issues addressed as well, that we can't just ignore those and focus on our weight. We want to try actually treating the mental health issues will also probably advance our obesity journey as well. Exactly. I think we have often treated them as separately in silos. And one of the main things is that we should be treating these concurrently or together. Uh, because if we can treat them together, we are likely to get better outcomes longer term. Uh, people aren't suffering in silence. Um, and we might not be scratching our heads a year into treatment trying to figure out why is this not working or why is this not sticking in terms of the, the response when we could have perhaps identified this earlier on and helped our patients uh, get a better outcome long term. In case you're just joining us, we're here with Dr. Sanjeev Sakalingam, the Scientific Director of Obesity Canada, talking about obesity and mental health. And we're giving away an in-depth guide to getting coverage for the medical treatments you need if you answer our trivia question, which is, true or false, obesity is a chronic medical condition. Is that true or false? Is obesity a chronic medical condition? Put your best guess in the comments and you will get that guide delivered to your Facebook Messenger inbox. So you're the Scientific Director of Obesity Canada. Tell us about Obesity Canada's mission. Obesity Canada is our national organization for uh, obesity care. Its mandate, and I'm, I'm pleased to say, has developed over time and expanded, is to really improve the lives of Canadians who are living with obesity. That includes uh, improvements in advocacy, particularly advocacy for treatments and treatment coverage, which is a significant issue right now. Uh, education, which includes education of healthcare providers, but also of patients in the public. 
And of course, um, in terms of research, we need to bring together the researchers. And I'm proud to say, you know, across Canada, we have a great group of researchers from a range of disciplines who put their heads together to think about these complex issues and to uh, develop research projects that will help patients of today. So historically, there's been stigma associated with both mental health and obesity. And we've really seen that stigma around mental health change over the last 20 years. Are you hopeful that something similar will happen with obesity? I've often thought about this living in two spheres here. I've seen a change in mental health and I tried to reflect on what are the secret ingredients? Why did we 20 years ago think about mental illness as almost that chronic condition that had no hope or recovery? And why have we moved to increased dialogue and awareness? Obviously, still ways to go, but at least people seeking treatment at this time. And how could we harness this for obesity? In thinking about this, I think there's a few things that come to light for me. And one, it would be that with obesity, we've just in 2013 recognized it as a chronic medical condition. For example, depression, we probably had another decade or so of recognition, still late for both, uh, but at least we rec we've recognized it. With that, I also think there have been better treatments in mental health care. We often had people confined to hospitals or secluded in historical days. Now we have people who have get treatments, a range of treatments that have pretty good effect sizes, very comparable to other physical health conditions. And finally, for obesity, we are seeing similar trends, right? We have better uh, surgical treatment options, psychological and other medication treatments. So the, the things that we are thinking about and can offer for our patients have started to expand, which creates hope, uh, which creates people maybe seeking treatment at this time. And then the last would be with mental health, a lot of organizations have come forward and government to really take a public health approach to this. And in obesity, I think this is where we still have a sticking point. We've had awareness campaigns, some that have been really bad and not very patient-centered and not really had language or images that would foster or uh, mitigate weight stigma or weight bias. But we now know a lot more and that we can do better. And I think for us, it's really important to think about how we can harness that, revitalize our public health approach to get the message out to patients and the public. You've been working in the obesity field for a long time. In your opinion, what is really important for Obesity Canada to be focused on right now? Obesity Canada has been focused on advocacy, but our advocacy has to shift right now. And the number one thing is access to treatment. We've published report cards in Canada for surgical access, medication coverage, and other treatments, including nutrition and psychological treatments. And I'm sad to say the numbers are not great. And so we really need to think about how we can work with government provincially and federally to think about how do we get coverage for people living with obesity. It is pretty scary to think and sad that people living with diabetes might have access to coverage for medications uh, through uh, their drug formularies in their provinces, but also that governments invested in treatment centers that bring together teams in their communities to actually provide care for diabetes. And we know that obesity is a chronic medical condition. It is one that has recognized uh, association with mortality and, and uh, functional impairment, impact on our workforce, impact on families, and yet we still haven't invested in bringing together these teams, coverage, and access to care. And so I think that's a huge focus for us. So Obesity Canada is really a world leader in patient advocacy for people living with obesity. What are the opportunities available for Canadians who want to advocate on behalf of people living with obesity? How can they help you advance your mission? Our mission wouldn't be what it is without people living with obesity engaged from the get-go. And I'm, I'm proud to say that Obesity Canada has many ways for people who are interest, interested in uh, being engaged in our organization. And so one of the ways is we have uh, people living with obesity who can join some of our public advocacy groups, our uh, committees, uh, really that shape both our policy and advocacy efforts, but also education and training. We 
Uh, also have included people with lived experience in the development of our uh, Canadian obesity guidelines. And those guidelines include messages for patients or public because it's often hard, I know it's hard to believe, but often hard that, uh, to understand that in these guidelines, we're often speaking to healthcare providers and using a lot of jargon. And it's been so refreshing to have language that reaches a broader public and people living with obesity so they can actually use these guidelines and feel empowered to join us in that advocacy movement. So I think there are lots of opportunities from you know further guideline development, some of our committees, uh, and there are also webinars and education resources on our website, including tools and toolkits that you could use if you are there struggling with obesity or wanting to advocate for people living with obesity that you could take to your employer, to uh, your uh, school, uh, or to your government official to tell them about why obesity matters. Obesity Canada has so many wonderful patient resources, and we will definitely put a link to all of that in the comments. Fabulous. Last question for you, Dr. Sakalingam. What is the number one thing you wish people understood about obesity? The number one thing that I hope people take away is that we should be moving away from that notion of eat less and exercise more and thinking about obesity as a complex condition that's associated with many other health outcomes. And I'm glad today we're talking about mental health and obesity. That's one of those conditions. And I hope that this episode could actually reach out to a few people who are listening to say, you know, it's okay to uh, be living with obesity and uh, seeking help at this time. That if you might be struggling also for mental health conditions um, in the context of managing weight and obesity, that there is help and there are treatments available. And so I'd like to end by people taking away hope as the way in which that they can uh, approach obesity care and mental health uh, moving forward. So there are treatments out there for both conditions and, and progress is possible. Progress is possible and there are supports and people who want to help you. Dr. Sakalingam, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been such an inspiring conversation. Thank you for having me. Thanks for this conversation as well. And a big thank you to everyone watching at home. We so appreciate you being here and chatting with us in the comments. Before we go, here's the answer to our trivia question. True or false, obesity is a chronic medical condition? The answer is true. If you didn't get to answer the trivia question, but you'd still like that helpful guide, just leave a comment for us and tell us what you thought of the show. We will be back to you with a new episode in a few weeks. Until then, please stay safe and take good care. Good night.